Good afternoon. Shh. Ready? All right, welcome back. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to property. Um, first off, I have a bit of a treat. My very first day teaching was my birthday. And I do the ending every semester as a treat. So you all get cookies without the glass. It's true. Yes, it goes downhill quickly from here. Um, it's not my birthday. It was in August, but uh, uh, it's not my birthday today. And uh, actually, can I just, just hand these around? Do you yeah. mind? Thanks so much. All right. Uh, number two, just, just scatter boxes, enough for everyone. Uh, number two, you should have the iClicker app installed. I'll have this running at the start of every class. Uh, please be here on time. Uh, if you're late, you're not here. Uh, so please be here on time. This is not a 9 a.m. class. I shouldn't have this problem. Uh, uh, but uh, hopefully you all uh, uh, be timely. Uh, the second thing is I want to get to know your names as quickly as possible. So I have these little tent cards and markers. Write your name in big letters. Whatever you want me to call you, I don't care. A nickname doesn't matter. Uh, I won't look at the seating chart, I'll look at this, and just bring this to class every day. Uh, you can call me Josh, just put your first name, we'll be on a first name basis, all right? I'll pass these around as well. Okay. Okay, one on this side, and just pass these around. If there's not enough, I have more in my bag. And then one over here, okay. Uh, last thing, uh, seating chart, uh, please write your name. I don't care where you sit, just sit in the same place every time and don't move around. Okay? I think those are all the announcements I have for now. You have your cookies, you have your name tent cards, you have your markers. Uh, uh, yeah, just take half of it, exactly. Half and fold in half, just like, uh, just like this. No, no, just first name is fine. I don't need last names. It takes up too much space. Uh, you have one already. That's impressive. Well, just write your name, big letters, uh, and that helps. Okay. Um, shh. Everyone, okay, settle down. Okay, uh, also, uh, the classes are recorded. Uh, that's the camera right there. It's not Alexa. Uh, they usually stream live to YouTube, although the software is a little finicky. I'll upload it later today. Uh, but attendance is still required. It's not a substitute for coming to class. Uh, the reason why is generally I have a microphone here. You can hear me, but you can't really hear the students. So you, the videos are not a substitute, but it will get you uh, if you miss class for whatever reason. Okay? Questions? All right. I want to start off by walking through the syllabus, which I think you'll have. Yes? Okay, good. Um, I understand the monitors on the sides are not working today. Is, are they still off? Okay, uh, sorry, so if you're sitting on the sides, I'm sorry. I apologize if you can't see the screen well. Uh, the syllabus, you should have a link to. It's a Google Doc you can open up in your screen and we'll walk through it one at a time. Um, and I see a lot of people are accessing, so you're there. Okay, uh, everyone have the book. The book was in stock? Okay, good. Uh, I know the books are expensive, unfortunately, but uh, hopefully you're able to get a copy that might have been used and uh, uh, you'll make as good as you can. Um, okay, first question people ask about the exam. Uh, this class, we like all the other classes. You have a single three-hour exam. Open book. Bring whatever you want. It will not help you. I promise. It won't help you. It will not help you. You can bring something commercial outline. You can bring something you create. I don't care. It will not help you. Um, it really won't. I've uploaded all of my old exams and their links in the syllabus. They're all there. I all, I've also uploaded the A-plus exams and various memos I use to help. Could you just run it over there to the side? They never, they never get it. Oh, we don't have a... Marker? Yeah, Markers this way. Thank you. I love when that happens. Just spontaneous order. It's good. Um, all the exams are online, as are the A-plus answers, and also I write a memo. Um, at some point around the middle of the semester, you should start taking a look at those seriously and take them. Not just look at them, actually try and take a sample exam. I have some old midterms up there. Um, I do not give an in-class midterm anymore, and I'll explain to you why. I used to, but I stopped. Uh, under the South Texas grading policies, your final exam is 100% of your final score. You know that, I think, all too well. I cannot make your midterm count. I can't. I wish I could, but I can't. 
So I found in the past that when I give a midterm that doesn't count, none of you take it seriously. You don't. You blow it off. And it's a lot of work for nothing. So I've stopped giving it. Unfortunately, you pay for the sins of your past classmates. Uh, but I found that it just didn't add much. What I will do is if you take a midterm, I will grade if you one-on-one. -on -one. I'll come to my office. We can talk about it. But I'm not going to do it in class. It takes up too much time, and it doesn't really achieve anything, unfortunately. Um, I, I wish we could change the school's grading system, but that's not my, um, that's not my uh, uh, power. Professors have very little power. You think we're powerful? We're not. Uh, uh, everything here is majority vote. We can't agree on anything. So it, it's change happens very slowly uh, at any institution. OK, so that's the exam. Uh, attendance, please be here on time. I can't stress that enough. Uh, when you come in late, it creates a disruption. It bothers your classmates. You have to go down the aisle and put your backpack down, your laptop out. Just be here on time. Um, I'm assuming you have class before this? Some of you yes, some of you don't. All right, well, this is 2 PM. This is not a 9 AM class. So I don't think I'll have the, I got stuck in traffic. I couldn't find parking. Just get here around lunchtime. I think you'll be OK. Uh, uh, again, the, the eye clicker is on. If you aren't able to get to work, you can just give me a, uh, uh, just come up after class and tell me. Um, but we'll, we'll get straightened out. I don't think this is, you're used to this already. Um, office hours. Uh, today, I have office hours basically the rest of the day. Uh, I'm here until basically 10 o'clock. I have the 7.45 till 9.15 class. So I'm here after this class. Do you have class after this? No. OK, good. So if you have office hour questions after this class at 3.30, uh, come to my office, and I'll be here I, seriously till like 7:45. So uh, we will find a time to meet. Uh, sometimes it's complicated with people's class schedules, but this one should work out well. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> how to get a hold of me? Email is very good. Uh, I will respond to emails very quickly. But if these are substantive questions, uh, come in person. Uh, uh, if you ask me a substantive question over email, say come talk to me. Um, I find that almost invariably the question you ask isn't actually the question you want answered. You just don't have to phrase it. And I can usually pick it apart in a few seconds and get to what you really want to know. So if you send me an email question, I'll be like, OK, come see me tomorrow, and we'll get it worked out. Um, I mentioned all the classes are on YouTube um, from past semesters. At least one of you already found them. Um, I encourage you to watch these. Um, YouTube has a fun feature where you can play it at different speeds. You probably know about this, right? You can watch a video at one and a half speed, two speed. I talk pretty fast. Maybe one and a quarter is about where you ought to watch it. But a lot of the top students will always watch last year's lecture before class. I am not that original. I tend to ask the same thing every year, more or less. You get prepared a lot better. Um, some students will re-watch the current lecture after class. So the, the camera right there, it's recording. It'll be online later tonight. Watch it after class to fill in gaps in your notes. What does that mean? I don't want to see you doing this, typing every single word I say. That's not a good use of your time. Use the class to sort of you know, embrace what I'm saying and absorb it. And you can go back later and fill in gaps. Uh, when you're doing this, you're not actually thinking. It's not very effective. Um, I do recitation probably differently than some of the other professors. Uh, the way I do it is I start with right there, Sarah, and I go up and down every row. And everyone gets one question. I can do about 60 people a class. Not always, but when I'm pushing for it, I can do about 50 to 60 people a class. There are about 80 of you here. So there's a pretty good chance we called on every other class, give or take, plus or minus. This, I go all the way around, side, side. I get everyone. It works very well. Um, the upshot is, if I'm asking Sarah a question, see that I love the name tags, Jasmine has to be paying close attention because she gets a follow-up. And then Catherine over there gets a follow-up to Jasmine's. And then, then Monique gets a follow-up to Catherine. See, I, I love these name tags. I know if your name's already. It's perfect. What you, what's that, a little clown? I like that. Yeah. I like that. Little just skills of justice? That's yes. a, I like that. It's good. Creative. Um, so the name tag, did you get name tags in the back? Didn't get there? OK, cool, cool, cool. Take your time, guys. All right, um, so I will call on just about everyone. That means is you have to be prepared every day. Um, I will know very quickly if you're not prepared. Uh, it, you, you can't fool me. Um, you're now in your, I guess, your second semester. You know what it means to fall behind. You know what it means to try and use the, the commercial outlines and the resources. We, we, we know very quickly if you're using that. 
So I encourage you to please stay ahead with the readings. I try to keep them uh, manageable. 20, 25 pages, seldom more than 30 pages a week, uh, or, sorry, per class. So I try and keep the readings on the lower end. Okay? Go with me so far. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, on the syllabus, we have a link to a folder. It's a Google Drive folder, and if you haven't used Google Drive, get to know it. You'll, I'm sure you'll experience it quite a lot. And I've uploaded lecture notes for class. I don't write with my hand. I, you don't want me to write with my hand. Um, and there's one document for every class. So this is class number one. I know this is really small. It's hard to read. I'm sorry. I'll get this straightened out after class. And I will sometimes paste uh, pictures and you know different graphics and things that are you know I think relevant to class. Uh, I can also type up here, right, on, on the fly. So these are live notes. You don't need to type along with them. You can just copy and paste. Does anyone else need the the cardboard? You just yeah, walk, 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 just take some out and walk them over. Thanks so much. I like this teamwork. It's very good. I pour aside the class. Do you guys get your cookies? Okay, at least, at least you're fed. Um, that's important. Okay. Um, okay, that, so far so good. Um, the class schedule here is very precise. I've laid out what we're covering in every class from now to the end of the semester. Whatever I say we're going to cover, we're going to cover. I don't fall behind. has never happened. I, I, mean, that's, I don't fall behind. I know what I'm doing. Right? Um, I can time classes very effectively, move faster or slower as need be. What that means is you know exactly what readings are assigned for you today, tomorrow, and the day after. Right? So today we have Johnson uh, on class number two for the 16th. That's Thursday. You have uh, a Gen v. Rich and Keeble versus Hickering Gill and a couple other cases. You have to read those cases, right? But that means is there's no doubt about what you have to read. It's not like read 15 pages ahead. This is where we will be. Um, there's not going to be, unless you have like, I guess there are not really any hurricanes this time of year. So unless there's some sort of weird fluke storm that we cancel class, we're going to be right on schedule. I have a couple of makeups at the end. I don't think I ever need them, but I put them there just in case. Okay. Um, I think that's it. All right, and if we and if all goes to, to, to plan on the 25th, which is the uh, last day of scheduled class, I'm sorry, the 23rd, uh, we'll have a review session in class. If all goes to plan, I think it will be. And if we don't need to make a class, I'll just move the review session up a day. That, that works out well. Okay, what do you need? You guys are coordinating, I like this, this is good. This is, this is harder than it looks. I actually, what's your name? Marcos. Marcos, I appreciate your, uh, your efforts. And a marker, come on, hand this guy a marker. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions so far? It always takes about 15 minutes, but then we get it done and it's done for the semester. I considered printing them, but I found that people often have like nicknames and things they want to be called, so I didn't want to box people in. So I just let them write their name with a marker, and I think that, that's probably easier, but that, that, that works well. Okay. What else? Okay, let's start. Um, property is going to be different from your other 1L classes. There is no restatement second of property. Well, there is, but no one cares about it, right? There's not like, we'll get to that. There's not like a single uniform body of property law, right? There's not really a uniform property code like a UCC. The black letter stuff in this class isn't going to be as helpful for you. Um, and the reason why is largely a story of history. Property developed in this country based on laws that existed in England. And property laws in every state are different. The laws in New York are different than the laws in California, are different than the laws in Texas, are different than the laws of Louisiana. Um, you're going to have to bear with me for a bit as we start this class. And you realize very quickly that there are not many statutes to learn, there are not many code sections to learn, there are not many tests with four factors for you to learn. It's a little bit different. There are some broader concepts and, dare I say, theories that you're going to have to learn. Uh, the second thing I want to tell you is that property one is not what you thought it is, right? When you think of property law, you think, oh yeah, buying and selling houses, right? No, that's not this, right? That's property two. Property two is actually real estate dealings, how to actually engage in a modern day society to transfer property. Property one is all very um, old stuff. Um, some rules that are arcane and not really relevant. 
like today's reading, for example, what the hell with the Indian? What, what are you reading, right? <laughs> you will find very quickly this class doesn't fit with what you probably thought property law was. But we will get to the more practical stuff a little bit later um, in the term. Okay. I want to now walk through at a high level where we're headed this semester. Which I think I think does uh, does does help you uh, get a, get a, get a vision to start. Um, the first few classes concern acquiring property in unusual situations. So our reading today involved acquiring property from a newly conquered territory. For, thir for Thursday, we're talking about hunting, right? How do you acquire property by hunting animals? And the same for the class number three. Then we move on to what's called the rule of capture. How do you occupy, how do you capture oil? gas, water, right? These are things that you probably never thought about, but these are basic issues of property. How do you have property in yourself? For example, your organs, your skin, your tissue, your blood. Is there property in your own self? We talk about what's called the right to exclude. Why are you allowed to kick someone off your property? What is property, right? We don't get to define what property is until about two weeks into the class. One way to find property is to find it. We all know finders, keepers. You can get property by receiving a gift. But then by class nine, about the middle of February, we move into probably the hardest part of the semester. What's called estates. This is a topic that will torment you, but I will walk you through it carefully. Estates describe how people are connected to their property, both in the present, property you have now, in the future, property you get at some point later, and even property that you might be able to lose if things happen. And we spend class 9, class 10, class 11, class 12, 13, no class from the 27th, 14. So basically we spend a bunch of classes on this topic of estates. We move on to what's called co-ownership. How can you own property jointly with others that is not just by yourself? This is not just like a roommate, but it's a little bit more intense than that. Then we do a topic that comes out of nowhere, marital property, right? And the laws in Texas are quite unique. Texas has what's called a community property regime where a husband and wife or husband and husband or wife and wife who own property can own it jointly. Then we move on to what, called, then we move on to what are called leaseholds. Many of you have probably have apartments with leases. This is a little bit more relatable of a topic. Then we finish with landlord-tenant relations, which is also a little bit more relatable. And that's a semester, right? It'll be over before you know it. Trust me, the, you know this. Time flies so quick. I, it, it's, it, every semester, it's like you just start and you're already done. Uh, you will be done with South Texas before you even know it. It, just, it goes by in a blink of the eye. You won't remember any of this stuff. I promise you won't. But it'll be over before you know it. You'll remember some stuff. Maybe remember the cookies. I don't know. Hopefully remember something, <laughs> something nice about me. Uh, that's where I start with the good cookies from Costco. They're good. All right, all right, can we start? All right, let's actually start the class. Um, let's start actually, ah, perfect. Any LSU fans here today? Oh, okay, Nancy, I'll start over here, all right? Uh, did I trick you? Yeah. Are you in a good mood though from last night? You didn't watch? OK, fine. I read, I read All right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, I'm, OK, good, good. I'll just start with Sarah, because that's what I said I was going to start. OK, this is easy. Go to your book. you have your book with you? OK, thank you, Sarah. Go to your book and go to page 667, please. I want to start off with, this is not in your reading, I know, but it, it, it's short, it's funny, it involves Louisiana, and I guess it's fitting. Uh, they, they won the championship last night, in case you didn't watch the game. OK. All right, you want to just, yeah. Question. For the I reaper, do we need to stay locked in? No. no well, let me, let me, I, I will usually do a quiz. Uh, it's not graded or anything, uh, but you should start class with a, with a multiple choice question, a true false question. I didn't do it today because we're just getting started. Uh, but the way you usually do it is you have your attendance and then you put a quiz on and you can say yes or no or true or false. And then after that, you can turn it off. Oh. Um, you can do the I reef on your phone and there's a browser version as well on your computer if you don't want to bring your phone to class, which is fine. Uh, but if anyone doesn't have a phone or a computer, you can talk to them and figure something else out. It, 
it happens every once in a while, but you know, I can deal with it. All right, Sarah, you want to read for me the paragraph that, 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 that begins, gentlemen? And let me just clarify, when they say state of the title, this is a lawyer writing a letter. And someone asks him, basically, who owns Louisiana, the state? Who owns Louisiana before 1803? All right, so go on, Sarah. Just want to read that, please? Ed Orgeron would have just said that last, not last night. Oh. <laughs> uh, th thank you, Sarah. So, OK, everyone always chuckles at this. It's kind of funny. But I like to start the semester here, right? Because what is property, right? What, what are we even talking about, right? When we say property, you probably think of a house, right? But is a house actually the property? No, no. The house is just a structure on a piece of land, right? You can knock a house down, build another house, right? Go with the camping, with sleeping bags, right? Property doesn't refer to the house. It refers to the land. But land isn't just some sort of flat surface. There's stuff below it. You might have you know, minerals or oil or gas. And you have stuff above it. Remember air rights. I'm sure you say that in torts. Right? How do we decide who owns a piece of property? Well, maybe one way is to say, okay, who owns it today? Okay, Josh owns his house there. Okay, where did Josh buy from? Josh bought it from Sarah, and Sarah bought it from Jasmine, and Jasmine bought it from Catherine, right? But at some point, those sorts of transactions don't really work, right? Which is why this lawyer, this funny guy, was asked to put a, a, a letter together about who owned Louisiana before the state of 1803, right? That's when the United States acquired Louisiana by virtue of the Louisiana Purchase, President Jefferson's uh, uh, deal. Okay. So it says, in 1803, the United States acquired the territory from France by purchase. Okay, that seems straightforward, right? You can buy land from someone else. You can buy land anywhere you want. Okay. Now, where did Louisiana get the territory from? I realize this keeps shifting and shimmying. It's probably very distracting. You even notice it's shifting a little bit. I'm going to fix this later. Okay, so where did Louisiana get it from? Louisiana got it from Spain by conquest. Conquest. Jasmine, what, is this, what does this mean? Louisiana got, I'm sorry, uh, Spain obtained it, purchased of conquest. France acquired the title from Spain by conquest. What does that mean? What's conquest? Yeah, one at a time, just here. From whom? From Spain. Yeah. What, what does it mean to conquer? Just, just give like me another. Conquers, like the no, no, no. Just one at a time. Uh, Not your turn. Uh, to, uh, to conquer, I guess, like if you have like a war. You're, like, war. Like, yeah, good. So France and Spain had a war. And who prevailed in that war? Who won in that war? Spain. I mean, France. Yes, France. Yeah. France won the war. And then with the conquest, they gained the land. Right, in the Johnson case, we'll talk about later, conquest is one of the ways you obtain land. Okay, so France got from Spain by conquest, by war. Let's go one level back, right? Catherine, where did Spain get Louisiana from? Um, they discovered it. Acquired title by virtue of the discovery. So Christopher Columbus, right, in 1492, he discovered this new world this territory, right? But Monique, what authorized Columbus to discover this new world? Uh, the queen. The queen. 
right? And what gave the queen the authority to authorize Columbus to make this journey? The Pope. And where's the Pope gets authority from? And, and God, right? Therefore, God owns Louisiana, right? Okay, it, it's meant to be a little bit funny, right? But it, it, it raises a few important points, right? Let's start with the purchase, right? Chelsea, let me ask you a question, please. Why, this, this, this is going to sound really obvious, but I want to make the point bluntly. What does it mean to purchase something? I know it sounds so obvious, but just, just hear me out. What does it mean to purchase something? Yeah, what does it mean to buy it? By what means? The For? Money. But why is money valuable? I know this sounds really dumb, but. Uh, so why did France, and you don't need to know history here, but why do, why do you think France exchanged land for money? It's an easy answer. Why does anyone do anything for money? Value. Does that have more value or less value than the land? Would Louisiana have made the deal if they were worse off? Okay. The reason why people make transactions is they are gaining value, right? Louisiana, I'm sorry, France at the time valued the money more than they valued the land. There's a lot of history behind it, which is not important here, but you won't make a transaction that makes you worse off. Generally, people do things they think it's in their interests, right? But this teaches us that when you have a piece of land, you can transfer it in exchange for something that's not land, right? You're not swapping one piece of land for another, you're swapping a piece of land for money. This teaches a lesson. Land can be transferred, right? Land is not fixed with the same person forever. The land doesn't move. It's not like you just picked up a piece of soil and moved it somewhere else. You are transferring ownership of the land. You are transferring title to the land. Right? And just, just think about that for a minute. What does it mean to transfer ownership? Right? There's not like a piece of paper. Right? There's not like you have a, you know, you're, you're, you plant your flag on the soil. Right? It's recognized France owned it and then the United States owned it. Is that Kinza? Kinza, let me ask you the next question. It says France got it from Spain by conquest. This is a harder question. Why does conquering, why does winning a war mean you get the land. What, what tells us that? Well, you outfought the others. You outfought them. That, that's correct. Yeah. You killed more of their people, probably. Mm -hmm. But why does it mean you get their land? Well, I'm sorry? Who would take it from you? Well, okay. For sure, that's right. It means you, you kick their butts, they, they run away scared, so you take their stuff. That's not why I asked, right? Why does winning a war mean you get to take their stuff? Ooh. Is that Chris? Why does conquering, why does winning a war mean you get to take their stuff? Because <coughs> the conquering party would stay there and occupy. And Says, yeah, but why is, that, why is that the rule? Says who? It's not in your book. <laughs> why is that the rule? I think you stated a rule, but how do you know that's the rule? Is that the restatement second of conquering? I mean, where do, where do you get this from? <laughs> I guess it would trace back to the, like, the royal queens and kings. So, so, what's it being traced back? I'm giving you a hard time on purpose. Sorry. How do we know that's the rule, Mike? How do we know that's the rule? That when you conquer someone, you get their stuff? That's how it's always been. That's how it's always been. So that, that, is that the law, whatever it's always been? Kind of. Ooh. Nancy, you got, finally, you got a reprieve of about 10 people. You, you said, is that... Is how that do we know the that's the rule? Why, why is that the rule, that when you conquer, you get to take your land? Do you think the losing party accepts that rule? No, but they have no recourse. Yeah. They've already been destroyed. They got their butts kicked, right? Yeah. All right. So we have this, this sort of this, this rule of conquer, right? This rule of conquest, where if you conquer someone, you get their stuff. It's not written anywhere. Right? There's no statute that says it. There's no you know, code book that says it. Is that Nicholas? Yes. Yeah, just hang tight. Fill up the thing in one second. Let's go to the next line. <coughs> Spain acquired it by virtue of discovery. Why does, first off, what does it mean to discover? It means you're the first one to lay eyes on it or to come across it. Oh, okay. Was Columbus the first person to lay eyes on this, on this region of the world? 
No. Not even close. No, no, there, there, were, there were entire nation of people here, right? Um, and, and do you think the Vikings beat Columbus by, by several centuries as well? But let's just assume Columbus was the first person to see the land. It's not true, but let's just assume that for a minute, right? Why does looking at something mean you get to keep it? If you're, if you're the first one to discover it, then no one else is staking a claim to it. Sure, that's true, but, but, but so what? Why does it mean it's yours if you're the first one to see it? Because you can be certain that you're the one that found it first. How do you know you're the first? Because you didn't have to conquer anybody for it. Oh, so you're saying if there's no one there, that means you don't have to conquer it, so you get it just by looking at it. Jordan, like, you're, you seem a little uncertain. What do you think? How do you, why does being the first one to see it mean you get it? Uh-huh. It's kind of like the, there's no one there, so you can't conquer it. So so it's yours? Yeah. Ah, but if there's someone there, then you got to beat them to death before you get it. Well. Yeah. <laughs> right, but but we did have people there, Ashley, right? There were an entire race of Indians who were living in this continent, up and down the, up and down the world, right? Does this little paragraph from Louisiana acknowledge that there were people there before? Why do you think... <clears throat> that this you know, lawyer who wrote this letter just said Columbus discovered it. What, what sort of authority do you think he might have been relying on when he wrote this? I'm connecting our... You've read one case. Not, there's, only, there's only one answer to this question. What authority do you think he was sort of invoking when he sort of skipped over the Indians? You've read one case. I'm, I'm talking about a case. Oh, case. What did Johnson say about the status of the native people? That oh. they couldn't hold the land. They were savages. And there we go. Okay, now, now you see where I'm going with this. Okay, so we have these principles, right? Thank you, Ashley. We have these principles that I think we can deduce from this one little paragraph, right? <clears throat> Property can be acquired by buying it. Not just transferring land for land, but transferring money for land. And it allows you to take something called ownership, whatever that is. We'll, we'll talk about what ownership is later. You can also get land by conquer, by fighting a war and, and winning. If you lose, too bad. But if you win, yay, go you, right? You won. You get to keep Louisiana. And then you have this idea of discovery, that if you're the first one there, if no one's seen it before, by merely laying eyes, I think that's what you said, by merely laying eyes on it, you can acquire it. But there's an exception to this rule. If the people who maybe reside in this land are Indians, and they don't count because they cannot own <coughs> the land in the first place, so therefore Columbus was the first person to actually go there because the natives were not people. They were some sort of savages who weren't entitled to respect in this regard. All right. Questions so far? Uh, yes, hold on. Let me, I want to get your names. Uh, how, do you, how do you pronounce your name? It's Jayla. Jayla. Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah, I think that's what Chief Justice Marshall says in Johnson, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. I, I see your point. Let, let's do Johnson. Maybe that, that might shed a little bit more light. Yeah. I did not enjoy this case. I'm 
it, but <clears throat> when I read it and then just like going over it and over it and over it again, um, it just kind of made it seem like all of the countries that wanted to come over and conquer land here in the Americas and colonize it and things to that effect, like it just didn't, they didn't even have to make deals or even if there were previous deals made. Like you back out of them. Null and void. Yep. All right, let, let's do the case. Maybe we'll come back to this in a bit, okay? All right, uh, who's next? I think you're next. I'm seeing the back of you. Uh, uh, okay, hold on. I, wa I want to look at you and see your name. Okay, Ryan. Okay. Ryan, you want to give me the facts, please, in Johnson? Only one case today, so it should be uh, not in the rings. We're not too heavy. Um, so there's a plaintiff who I believe. Okay, by the way, who's the plaintiff here and who's the Johnson. defendant? Okay. Johnson's a plaintiff and who's the defendant? McIntosh. Uh, McIntosh. I, I, this is a stupid point, but the little apostrophe thing is a C, <coughs> right? And I'll explain to you why. Um, back before uh, computers, you had what's called a printing press, right? And if you want to print, you need actually little uh, pieces with every letter on it, right? So if you want to put an M, you put a little M block, and you put a little C block, right? To save characters, instead of using a little C, they would use a comma. They would just, I'm sorry, an apostrophe. They would just flip an apostrophe around, so you know, like an apostrophe kind of looks like a C. And that's why it's an M apostrophe in Tosh. But it stands for Macintosh. Um, you're taking common law this semester? Oh, that's right, it's in the spring that you're taking it next year, right? Yeah, they changed it. This is, you're the first class, I think, with this new thing. Right, which is why I teach common law also, but there's no common law being offered this semester. It's in, it hasn't happened before in my entire time. So. You might have me, Lord help you, again, for Kamala in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the fall, possibly. I don't know. We don't get our schedules till about June, so I don't even know what I'm teaching in this in, in next year. But, but anyway, there's a case called McCulloch versus Maryland. You may have heard of it. Anyway, it's the same M, flip comma, or flipped apostrophe, C. Okay. All right, Ryan. So we have Johnson's a plaintiff, McIntosh is a defendant. You want to go out with the facts, please? What, just, just what does that mean, he had two grants? Just, just, just spell that out for me. Sold the land. No. Yeah, sold. Right, so this is purchase, right? You had people living there. They were the native people. Okay? And then, and then the chiefs of these tribes made a deal, mm -hmm. right? Bargained for land, and Johnson claimed land from these purchases. All right, go on. Then uh, McIntosh, he got a grant for the same land from the U.S. Ah. So we have a conflict, right? This is a very common conflict where two people are laying claim to the same piece of land. Two people are laying claim to the same piece of land. I promise you, almost every exam question I ask will have a fact pattern like this, right? Where you have two people where they both say, oh, I own this land. No, I own this land, right? Right? And what's a court to do? The court has to decide which of the two has a stronger claim. Right? They both have, I think, arguments about why they own the land. John says, look, I got it from these tribes. I got it from the chiefs. McIntosh says, no, 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 look, I got it from the United States government. Right? So they both have basically paperwork suggesting that they own this, this, this territory. So then it goes to the courts. And the courts have to decide who has the stronger claim to the land. Okay, Jay, how did the lower courts handle this? Uh, they said that, an act, well, the first said that an absolute title to land can't exist at the same time in different places. Yeah, you can't have two people owning the, the land at the same time. That's impossible. That much I think is correct. Okay, go on. And then they went on to say it was an exclusive right to purchase from the Indians that resided in the government. Ah. And if the exclusive right belonged to the government to buy it, what happened to Johnson's grants? Poof. OK. All right. So let's now go to Chief Justice Marshall's <coughs> opinion. Is that Ca Cassie? OK, with look, I like the little, little drawings in your card. All right, Cassie, let me ask you a question. This is the Supreme Court decision by Chief Justice Marshall, who you'll learn all about. He's a very famous, very famous judge. From 18, was it 23? Okay, so the, 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 the country, you know, is about 
a couple decades old, right? The Constitution was ratified in 1787, so we're about, you know, 40 odd years from ratification. So we have, you know, some laws. Um, Cassidy, does Chief Justice Marshall, in his opinion, cite any statutes to govern this dispute? No. Does he cite any uh, common law court cases, in his opinion? No. Does he cite any sort of, uh, uh, you know, written law at all? No. All right, Cassidy, so the million dollar question, my friend. What law does Chief Justice Marshall rely on? What is he relying on? Okay, European doctrine. What, 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 how does he refer to it? Like, what is that? It's a man made law. It's not okay. Law. Um, is it, is it Maybe. Uh, Ashley, wh how would you characterize the law that, that Marshall's relying on? Um, is history law? No, not really. So, what, what, what law is he relying on? In other words, let me ask you this question differently, Ashley. Where is Marshall getting this from? You read a long opinion, right? I made you read this long. It's sort of, you know, the sort of old English you speak, right? Yeah. Where on earth is he getting his authorities from? Like, if you want to, like, you know, shepherdize his opinion, you know, what, what, what is his authority that he's basing his decision on? Is this like any opinion you've ever read before? There's a couple old one and a couple old cases and like contracts. Okay, fine. But <laughs> as, okay, then, <laughs> fair enough. Okay, I shouldn't ask that question. Is this? I wasn't but where, where, Amir, where is this law? What, what law is he relying on? Where is he the, getting? The law of nature. The law of nature. Well, Marshall does say things like, we must rely on the law of nations, right? He uses these phrases. He talks about abstract justice, right? He talks about principles, right? Marshall is not relying on what you might call positive law, that is written law. He's relying on something else that is not written down. He's relying on history. I think Ashley said history, right? He's relying on, uh, you said the English, how did you put it? The English common law. Yeah, doctrine. English doctrine, right? He's basically taking historical practice as the basis for the law in this case. In other words, we should do here in a court, what's been done before in society. In other words, let's look at how society has treated similar situations, and that provides the basis for our rule of decision. Right? Um, now, you can criticize this doctrine. You can say, well, Marshall's just making this up. Um, maybe, right? I think, I think he's maybe making some of it up. But how would he decide it otherwise? Right? Uh, is that uh, so is that Sam or Cam? I can't see the top. That's at the top of his, looks like an S. Cam, let's just say you were on the Supreme Court in 1823, right? You were another justice and, you know, you have this case. What else could you have decided this case based on other than this notion that we looked to what history was done? How else could you maybe decide this case? Well, in this case, they both were laying claim to it at the same time, well, right? Whoever bestowed the, like, whoever had the authority to bestow the... the well, let me, let me just give you an example, right? Let's say the year's 2019, right? I sell my house to Cam today, and then tomorrow I sell my house to Ricardo tomorrow. I'm a crook, right? But I sell to Cam today, and I sell to Ricardo tomorrow. And you didn't know each other. You had no idea what's going on. Who would generally win in this sort of, I sell to Cam, and I sell to Ricardo? I would. Probably, yeah. So maybe just give it to the person who got it first, which in this case, who would that be? The oh, it can't be. Yeah, Johnson, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It'd be the guy who bought it from the Chiefs because he bought it first. So maybe one rule you could adopt is whoever purchased it first. Now, Ricardo, let me ask you a follow-up. If the court adopted that rule that the Indians were able to sell their property and 
this first transaction should be recorded first. <coughs> what would the consequences be of that sort of decision if the Indians were allowed to sell it first? Johnson would have a valid title. What about Macintosh? He would not because he would have done this second. And do you think Macintosh is the only guy who's purchased land from the government in this regard? You think there are other people who maybe purchased land that was previously sold by Indians? And what happened to all those contracts? Void. Void. And what about other land the United States government may have obtained from the native people? What happened to that? If the United States government obtained it from the Native Americans. And they had already, well, obtained it might be a, maybe a, 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 a poor choice of words. Let's just say they, 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 they conquered it. I'll use that word. Well, then they retained the title. But how, how can we... How come conquering allow you, allows you to get it? Because of Victor being loyal. Huh. But you see where I'm getting at? Let me, let me go to Victor for a minute, right, Victor? If we just take the principle the first person to buy is one who gets it, how do you think that would have affected the country more broadly? Well, it changes the dynamics of it. Changes That's right. Okay. Chief Justice Marshall was a very smart judge. He was not an idiot. And I think he recognized in this case that a decision for Johnson would have had significant impacts on the country as a whole. So he had to write an opinion that would eliminate any possible claims from the Indians, right? He had to write an opinion that would make it impossible to honor a contract conveyed by the Indians. And Nikki, how did he write that opinion? What did he have to do to write that opinion? Uh, he differentiated between a right to sale and a right to occupy. Okay, very good. But I want to get back to that in a minute, right? He explained that the Native people could live on it, but they couldn't own it. But Deanna, how did he draw that distinction, right? What enabled Chief Justice Marshall to draw that distinction that applies to Indians and other people? What did he have to do? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a fair answer, right? Yes. So I want to give you an analogy, right? In contracts, you study the age of consent, right? That if you make a contract with a minor under the age of 18, is that contract valid? No, right? If you make a contract with a 17-year-old, good luck enforcing it. You're not going to. Why? Because we presume that people under the age of consent lack capacity. right? They can't um, have the skills, the intelligence, whatever word you want to use, to engage in a contract. <coughs> oh, don't, no, no, not right now. Yeah, <laughs> you're, fi you're fighting way too hard on this one. The general point's correct, right? The reason why there's an age of consent is because you presume minors can't have the capacity to make contracts. That, that, that much is great. I, don't bring the UCC into this, please. Um, I, I left that behind my life long ago. <laughs> Marshall is treating the Indians who were of age as if they were children, right? Lots of other language too, right? Savages, you know, all that other stuff, right? But his basic point is these are people who are not capable of engaging in contracts. These people were not incapable, who lack capacity, if you will, like capable capacity, right? They're not capable of making contracts. Therefore, we're going to treat the contract from the Indians to Johnson as if it was a contract made by a minor. It's void or voidable. Which one is it? Is it void or voidable? Voidable. Thank you, voidable. It's voidable, and we void it, right? We void the contract because, no, no. <laughs> we void the contract precisely because they lacked any sort of ability to render these transactions. Think of it this way, right? The native people are allowed to live on the land. This was Nikki's point a minute ago, right? They're allowed to live on the land, right? If you're a miner, you can live in a house. There's nothing stopping you, but you can't sell it. You're basically trapped there, right? You can live there, but you can't sell it. Now, most miners eventually become major, right? Most people. God willing, right, live to the age of 18, and then they can engage in the transactions and sell stuff. 
but the Indian nations cannot. They are forever destined to be stuck in this sort of quasi child state, right? These savages, as they say, and they're stuck there. So therefore, any transaction that was given by an Indian tribe is now null and void. So Marshall, with one opinion, was able to resolve the status of probably thousands of claims in the country. One swoop. Everyone with me? But Marshall didn't only sanction this idea that the Indians were people who could not convey property. He also legitimated these notions of discovery by conquest and discovery by uh, acquisition by conquest and acquisition by discovery. Just let me say those clearly so you don't mess up your notes. You have acquisition by conquest and acquisition by discovery. I think I said it wrong a minute ago, right? So Jenny, why does Marshall seem to think that you can have this sort of acquisition by conquest? Where does he, or why does he think that's a legitimate form of acquiring property? Uh, a little bit more. I think, I think you're on the right track. Just give me a little bit more, please. Does Marshall talk about where the Indians got it from? He talks about Roman, right? Well, well, Romans, yeah, but I don't think Marshall is even aware of how the native people got there. You know, land bridge, all that good stuff, right? I don't think he's even cognizant of that back then at that point in time. But my, my more important point is why were the European nation, nations able to conquer land from the Indians, right? We know the Indians can't sell it, but why are they able to lose it by conquest? That's my question for you. Why are the Indians able to lose a land by conquest? What, what, what rule enables that? Well, let me ask you, Marcos, is the rule of conquest only limited to savage people? Um, the opinion, I think he relies on a little bit on religious thoughts because they consider them lesser people they call them heathens right but can you can you have a conquest between european nations no no they, well according to the opinion they respect each other they accept it did france and spain always get along yeah. what happened with the first thing i had you read where did france get louisiana from conquest by war right so this idea of war <laughs> european nations do not respect each other very much i think that's that i can say i can say it simply right but this idea of acquisition by conquest is not limited to the native people, right? It's not limited to the Indians. It could be uh, really for anyone, right? Any nation, right? Any time you have some sort of fight, the victor, the victory of the spoils, right? You, you acquire the land. But the discovery doctrine is a little bit different, right, Marissa? Yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Marissa, is there actually any land on planet Earth that is unoccupied. Antarctica. Antarctica, that might be a good example. Awesome. Some too yeah, one example that comes up a lot is volcanoes, right? Just imagine a volcano in the middle of an ocean somewhere, billows out la uh, lava, and it sort of solidifies, mm -hmm. and it makes a new island. Um, you also have man-made islands. This is actually a huge thing in the areas around China, where they basically build these, what effectively oil rigs, but they're Think, ah, this is our new land, right? And when you say this is part of our country, there's like a radius around it that's now your water. So it's able to <laughs> kind of expand their, their sphere of influence. Uh, what else might be new? Um, finding minerals underwater, right? If you find like an oil uh, deposit underwater, you say, oh, that, that's my land. Uh, one example might be the moon, right? Yeah, moon, or even Mars, right? Who owns space? And there are all these treaties governing it, right? But generally, the reason we're giving these examples is that no one's there. Right? No one's ever been to Antarctica. It's too damn cold. Right? A bunch of penguins there. Right? But were there people in the Americas before? Yeah. So how does Marshall square that one? How does he basically say you can discover land if there's people already there? What's, what's the answer to that? I think that's right. It's the same argument we discussed earlier. Right? These are effectively people who lack capacity to own land, so they don't count. You are discovering it. 
laying eyes on it, even if, no, even if there, there literally are, are people and nations and tribes already living there. So here Marshall establishes a couple principles, right? Uh, first, the native people <coughs> can live on the land. They can, I guess, hunt there. They can do various things there. But they cannot convey it. They can't sell it. Why? They're savages, right? They're inferior. They're not able to engage in transactions, similar to how a child could not engage in transactions. What about acquisition by conquest? Well, acquisition by conquest, that's a rule that applies to all countries, all societies, right? All societies can fight each other and keep the war. I'm sorry, they can fight each other and keep whatever lands they get from the war. Okay, that one seems straightforward enough. But then the discovery doctrine, the sort of inferiority thing kicks back in. Why? Precisely because the people who are already residing in these countries are inferior and their presence doesn't count. It's as if it was unoccupied land. Even though in many cases they were conquered, right? It's not just that they see the Indians say hi, right? They'd actually engage in warfare and they can claim it by conquest as well. So with the native people, they can claim it by discovery or if necessary by conquest to, to put down any sort of rebellion. Okay, everyone with me. Those, those are the basic rules. Now, where do these rules come from? History, practice, basically this is how it's been and this is how it will be unless a different choice is made. Okay. All right, question so far. Uh, yeah, Elias. Oh, okay. All right. So let me let me. Uh, oh wow, that shaking is very annoying. I'll try and fix that later. Um, let let me try to address Elias's question. Right? How does practice? How does historical precedent become law? Right? What Marshall seems to be suggesting, at least how I read that passage, is that if lots of people follow a certain tradition. If, if a great mass, like a lot of people, seem to do the same thing, that effectively becomes the policy. Um, I mean, this is not dissimilar from the common law, right? How does the common law develop? Well, judges make a decision. Well, one judge? I mean, many judges. And when many judges follow a certain routine, that itself becomes part of the law. And eventually that law may be codified in a statute or code. So I think what, what, what Marshall's getting at is we're not just basing this on you know, some sort of abstract notions of justice, but we're basing on how we understand society to have uh, behaved, right? And that, that's sort of the common law process uh, develops. Does that shed a little bit light on your answer? Uh, is, is it Dana? Yeah. Um, just to clarify, they said they were, um, to them it made sense to, con to conquer because they saw the Native Americans as enemies. Well, that too, right? Um, it wasn't just that they weren't able to engage in contracts because they If you want to think of it that way, conquer it, and then when the people won't leave, then you have to conquer it. I think that's kind of the, the way Marshall.
almost seems like European uh, conquest in another European country would not have this sort of paradox just because their cultures were clashed so much. Mm -hmm. Is that essentially what he's describing? Say it one more time. I think I, I might miss you in the middle. Uh, so it sounds like the conquest could happen in Europe <coughs> between two countries as long as a complete conquest wouldn't happen. Yes. Yeah. Didn't clash, so, you know. Right. I think the the discussion of the culture really only prevails on the on the um, on the on the acquisition by dis acquisition by discovery. I don't think the cultural issue really matters for the conquest element, right? When you fight a war, you fight a war. It doesn't really matter who you're fighting. Uh, but with the um, the discovery issue, the culture matters, and with the issue of uh, conveying property, right? That 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 it thing also plays into it, right? There, there are three elements here, right? It's the conveying to the property, right? There's the discovery. And there's a conquest, right? The the capacity of the native people matters most for the conveyance and for the discovery. I don't think it plays much of a factor in the third one, which is the conquest. Does that does that answer a little bit more, Caitlin? Yeah, that's not too much of a question. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, uh, is that Elias again? Yeah. So I, I actually didn't. I understand what, what Isaac when he says he understands that the people are inferior, but he also kind of offers this like hypothetical that if they would have joined like the mm. central covenant. Okay, yeah. You know, because it's all based on like, I feel like he's kind of thinking along a John Lockean like, train of thought. And he kind of it's very like, John Lockean. Yeah, I'll yeah. talk about Locke in a minute. Yeah, and he's just Yeah, like, but you tell us about John Locke. Tell us about John Locke. Oh, I'm you brought it up. an expert, but he, he's been, I think he says that uh, when you're part of a society, which he does kind of allude to in this, that you kind of make this deal Okay. Yeah, but close. Okay. Let me let me let me let me let me try it again. All right. So the <clears throat> um, I think I have a picture of him somewhere over here. Uh, yeah, that's John Locke. He looks like Mr. Burns. I know. Um, uh, uh, that's that's John Marshall. This is John Locke. Um, <coughs> John Locke was a very influential writer and thinker and philosopher. And John Locke tried to answer a question, where does property come from? And he imagined that at some point, somewhere, we all existed, all people existed in what he called a state of nature. Now, this is not anything to do with evolution, it's not about the Garden of Eden, don't get bogged down in details, but just, just accept the, you know, accept the, accept the image, right? That at some point man existed in the state of nature. There was no government and there were no laws. Right? So imagine you all lived in a country with no government, no laws. Right? If you want to use an example, imagine. You want to see the, did anyone see the movie The Purge? I kind of like that movie, not because of the, the actual violence, but I like the, the, the concept, right? It's basically for 24 hours, all the laws are suspended in, the, in, the, in, this, in this jurisdiction. Actually, the first purge was from Staten Island, which is where I grew up, so I can, I can relate to it quite well. Um, but imagine if you lived in a society where there are no laws, there's no police, there's no government. People do whatever the hell they want, right? And your property, your stuff, your food, your shelter, whatever you have, uh, is not secured. Why? Because if someone comes along and takes your food, you can't call the cops on them. All you can do is fight them, right? You can fight back, try and kill them, I don't know. Use force. And then Locke explains that in this sort of state of nature, there would only be violence. Hobbes as well made this point, right? That people are always going to be fighting for food. They're fighting for shelter, right? And it creates all this chaos and confusion, and that society can function. Aha, but there's a solution, right? How do you prevent this sort of chaos, this sort of conflict, this conquest? Locke, John Locke, explains that government was formed to protect property, right? The reason why we create a government is so that people aren't stealing our stuff all the time. 
right, that, that the government's formed to ensure that property is secured. That is, if I take someone's property, the government will punish me for some way, so I won't take his property. Right? But when you create a government, you surrender your own power, which means I can't go over and beat up Sarah to get her house. Right? If I want it, I have to buy it from her. Or if I want to take Jasmine's food, I can't just grab it from her. I have to actually pay her for it. Right? So you surrender your, sort of your natural power to do whatever the hell you want, and in exchange, you create a system that kind of resembles um, property. Right? That if I want something from Sarah or Jasmine, i got to pay them for it. I can't just beat them up. But the Lockean model isn't a good fit for what happened in the New World. Why? Well, think of it this way. The Native people weren't allowed to sell their stuff. They just had someone come along and take it from them. So how does perhaps Marshall channeling Locke describe this? He says, look, the Indians are still in the state of nature. Right, they're, they're, they're the savages who just fight. They didn't form the governments that we have. So therefore, they don't have the sort of protection of property rights. And to make this point bluntly, I think Elias and whether person alluded to it, they haven't mixed into us. They haven't um, absorbed into our culture in such a way that they'd be entitled to the respect. Right? The reason why Jasmine and Sarah get protection from the government is they're part of the society. But the Indians are outside that society, and therefore they don't receive the protections of those laws. Right? So to, to, and I don't think this is actually what Locke thought. Locke actually had a very complicated view of the Indians, which is not worth diving into here. But I'm just trying to summarize the, the general idea. Um, the Indians still are in the state of nature. Unless they enter into our system of government, they don't get the protections of that property system, which is why the discovery doctrine, why the conveyances were, were nullified. Is that, Elias, I know there's a long answer to your question. Does that shed a little bit light on what you were asking? Exactly. Oh, man, I'm good. Wow, that, that, that's impressive. I, I didn't think it was that good, but I'll, I'll take it. OK. Uh, yeah, I can't see your name tag. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can someone get her some paper, please? Oh, there's a row. Where are they? Are we out? There's only one left? Is, there, is that empty? Oh, wow. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, whoever didn't get, just come to my office after class. And I, have, I have another box of them. I brought like over a, a hundred, which is surprising. Okay, whatever. We'll figure out later. Just If you don't have one, just come to my class later, uh, my office later, 623, and I'll be happy, happy to give you a name tag. But questions on the case. We'll get to the name tags later. I'm sorry, was, was that your question, though? Yeah, that was my Do you have a question about the case? OK. All right. All right. All right, so let me try to summarize Johnson, which we spent you know, nearly, nearly an hour on. Um, I, think, I think Jayla made, it, made a fair point. This, this decision sort of summarized the basic way that um, property was acquired in the United States back at the, back at the time of the framing. Um, this was pretty, pretty foundational, pretty, pretty basic. And it's because of this decision uh, that this, to this day, uh, Indian tribes have this very um, odd status in the United States. And I don't want to go too far into this because Indian law is really complicated. But I'll just describe it briefly. <clears throat> we have today things called reservations. You've probably heard of it. Well, you know, casinos, right? Okay, it's not just casinos, right? The reason why they're often casinos is because those jurisdictions are not bound by the laws of the state in which they reside, right? They don't have the same sort of uh, alcohol and tobacco taxes, so often that's what they're selling. But that, that's not why they exist. They exist as nations unto themselves, right? Effectively, you have the United States and these little pockets, right? These little reservations that are governments themselves. They have their own courts. They have their own elected officials. They have their own, uh, you know, legislative departments, right, whatever they want to structure it as, um, they're not bound by the United States Constitution, right? They, they, they can follow it, which I think most of them generally do. They don't have to, but they, they can follow in their choice. Um, they're not citizens by birth, right? If you're born in a reservation, you're not a birthright citizen. The rules are actually a little complicated. You, you do get citizenship by statute, but it's not a birthright citizen. So they have this entire legal regime that exists unto themselves that 
stems back to the sort of history. And it's, it's not just the United States. Canada has Native people, uh, Australia, New Zealand, almost every, uh, 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 not every, but most non-European countries have this issue with the Native people, and every country has to deal with them in different ways. Okay. Okay. Questions on Johnson? All right. Um, if anyone wants to read more about this, there's a good book 10 years ago called 1491. 1491. The theme of the book is what was the United States like the year before Columbus got here? Um, I thought it was an excellent book. I read it some years ago. Uh, but it describes that there were various actual property regime systems, right? They actually were government systems. Um, descriptively, Marshall's wrong, right? The way he described the Indian tribes is simply inaccurate. Uh, they had uh, fairly sophisticated property regimes that would be familiar to things we have today. Um, I'll give you one example that, that, that's fairly um, uh, noteworthy. Um, it involved hunting, right? It involved hunting. So any, any hunters here, people who hunt, right? OK, so generally, with hunting, you have a limited supply to animals, right? That's why you have hunting season. They have permits, right? They issue license. You can only kill x number of whatever, deer, whatever you want to kill, right? So what happens when you have tribes who are, say, trapping furs, right, beaver or whatever? Generally, you say, well, if we're trapping furs and we have two tribes in the same region, I'm going to kill as many beavers as I can. That way he doesn't get them, and that way I have the most fur. But what actually ended up happening was that they divided up the territory. They said, these areas belong to tribe number one, and these areas belong to tribe number two. And how do they do this? Very ingenious, actually. They used a brand. By the same way, we have a cattle brand where you put like a symbol on a cow, you know it's yours. They would carve certain symbols into trees that represented their, their tribe. They say, OK, we put these symbols in these trees. That means it's tribe number one. And we put this symbol in this tree, tribe number two. And it actually worked pretty effectively. So even on the facts, Marshall was not accurately describing how these people organized their structure in society. Okay, That's one of the, one of the better examples. Okay. All right. Any other questions on the Johnson case? And I'll do a little bit preview of our class for Thursday. Uh, yes, Cassidy. Just take, to take a step back. You said Lockean notion of mixing. You want to just explain that for everyone? Because I think you, you're, you're right, but what, what, what are we talking about here? Well, let's, okay, let me, I want to take Cassie's question. I want to take a step back, right? Forget about land for a minute, right? Let's start thinking about how to acquire stuff, like, you know, this cup, right? So, Cassie, if you walk over and you take my cup, is it yours? You just come over and you take my cup. Don't do it, please, but if you take my, you can have the cookies. Those are yours, I promise. Is it yours? No. Why not? Okay. Well, let's take another example, right? You and I are on the uh, in the woods somewhere, and uh, we see a fox running through the trees, right? Um, we both shoot it at the same time, and you know, my bullet hits it first, and you miss, but then you actually get to the fox first, and you pick it up. Who wants a fox there? Because I shot it, but you got it. Hmm. I mean, let me. I could just pick it up and run away with it, and then it'd be mine. You know, you never know. Let me ask you one more question, then. I, I'll just to finish up. 
Let's say you spend an entire day trapping the fox and you corner it. And just as the fox is cornered, I come over, I'm a jerk, and I kill it. Whose fox is it there? No, it doesn't, does it? <laughs> I just sketched out for you a few different ways to acquire property, right? One, the first one is just acquisition by force, right? You just steal my stuff, right? You just take it away from me. Um, generally, as a society, we say that that's not okay. You can't just take someone's stuff. The second one's a little bit harder, though, right? The second one might be called first in time, right? Whoever gets it first, who actually gets their, their greasy hands on it first, right, keeps it, right? First in time, first in right, as they say. And then the third one is a little bit trickier. This is the Lockean answer, right? Locke was very big what's called labor, what's called labor theory. That if you put a lot of labor into something, for example, you spend a lot of time hunting an animal, chasing it, trapping it, that even if you don't get it, right, that some jerk comes at the last minute, it's still yours. Right, Locke would say you reward the person who puts the labor into it, even if they don't finish the job. The first in time rule, what's called the rule of capture, says whoever gets it first keeps it. Doesn't matter what work they put into it. Or you say, screw it, I'll just steal it from you, right? I'll just take it from you. The readings for um, class on Thursday concern these two theories. The rule of capture, that is first in time, or the lock-in labor theory. And someone's going to ask, Josh, which one's the right answer? Both. Um, at various points, different courts put weight in either this sort of fixed rule of capture or the Lockean labor theory. And even sometimes in the same opinion, judges will look at both. Um, you see a lot of Locke in Marshall's opinion. You'll see a little bit of the role of capture in his opinion also. Now, let me make this point bluntly. The rules of acquisition and the rules of conquest, the one we did today, right? Acquisition by conquest and acquisition by discovery. That only applies to land. Let me say it again. Acquisition by discovery and acquisition by conquest apply to the acquiring land. You do not apply those theories to acquiring stuff, like a fox or, a, or an animal, right? This is your first exam tip of many. Someone will do this on the exam, I promise you. I'm telling you, don't do it. If I'm giving you a question about hunting foxes, don't give me rule of conquest, rule of discovery, right? Give me rule of capture. If I give you a question about land, I want to hear about discovery. I want to hear about conquest, OK? Everyone get that distinction? Just make that clear in your notes. All right, and so for the reading on Thursday, to bridge it, we'll be talking about how to, how to acquire stuff. Yes, that's uh, name tag, uh, Ryan. Ryan, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry to circle back on this. That's fine. Why did the United States not, uh, let me ask you, let me rephrase that. Why did Chief Justice Marshall not write an opinion with respect to like the power dynamic between two different sovereigns, the Native Americans being a different sovereign from the United States, rather just, I don't even think you missed the discrimination he, and let me, let, me, let me address that. He actually later expressed regret about this opinion. Um, he actually wrote letters where he sort of said, uh, <coughs> I screwed up. He actually referred to the Indian status as a deep stain in the American character. So I think he later recognized that he probably screwed up here. Uh, by the way, you haven't taken con law yet, so you will study con law. John Marshall is considered one of the greatest judges of all time. I think he's really overrated. Uh, but I'm, I am, I'm an outlier. I, I, I don't like John Marshall for a lot of reasons. Not, not only this one, but I think he's extremely out. Uh, 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 he's extremely, um, uh, he's extremely overrated. In fact, a couple of years ago, there was a, a bit of a fight um, or a bit of a conflict about Chief Justice Taney, who you might know, wrote a decision called Dred Scott, which basically said slavery is part of the Constitution. I think that was also wrong. But um, a bunch of reporters were calling me saying, you know, you know, uh, you know should, we, should, we be, should we take down statues of Roger Tawney? And I said, well, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe we should take down statues of John Marshall because of the Johnson case. And I point him to this one. That didn't make the article. Uh, uh, but but they, they did have a reference how, John, how, how Marshall had some stuff about Indians also. Uh, but this opinion, I, I see this opinion as akin to Dred Scott for Native Americans. I, I think it's in a similar ballpark, uh, but it's, it's not viewed with so much... Um, 
uh, you know, negative reaction. People don't even know about it. Yeah, I, I always debate making this the first case of the semester because it's pretty heavy. It actually goes downhill from here pretty quickly. This, we don't, most of our cases are pretty boring in this class. I don't, I don't mean that lightly, but we have almost no US Supreme Court decisions in our class. This might be the only one, maybe one other, which is a good thing. I hate Supreme Court decisions and property. They're terrible. They make terrible rules. Uh, almost all of your cases this term are all state court decisions, which they think are much better. Is your hand up? OK. Hands up. Anyone else? OK. All right. Um, that's all I have. Uh, I think we covered everything. Uh, and I will see you all for Thursday. If you don't have a name tag, just come to my office. I'd be happy to give you one. Thank you.